Hi, all, and thank you for tuning in to tonight's program featuring Martin Amos and Steve Martin. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 25th season. We know that fiction tells the truth. Inside story is what Martin Amos calls a novelized autobiography. So Martin gives us truth with the illuminating force of fiction. It's a beautiful dive into his relationships with his larger than life friends, such as Saul Bellow and Christopher Hitchens, his wives, his women and family. From the moment we open it, Martin welcomes us in, hands us a drink and with humility starts his story. He integrates some contemporary literature into the narrative, including his own. And in some of the most haunting passages, talks to us about dealing with the death of loved ones. While he's at it, he writes a love letter to literary culture. I've never read anything like it. I love this book. As intended, it feels as if Martin is speaking directly to me without looking away, urging me to understand the fragility of life. Call it a novel, call it whatever you want. Inside Story is a beautiful achievement, suffused with warmth, compassion, and so much humor. Yeah, Martin Amos is really funny. This is not a contest, people, but if pressed, Steve Martin might just write funnier cartoon captions than Martin Amos. That hasn't been proved yet, we'll have to see. For his new book, A Wealth of Pigeons, which is right here. Um, Steve has collaborated with the New Yorker cartoonist, Harry Bliss. Harry drew the pictures and Steve came up with the captions as well as some of the ideas for the art. It was a revelation for me to discover that these drawings and one-line captions are like very short stories. Yes, a picture might be worth a bunch of words, but when those few words are written by Steve, the pictures seem to be worth a lot more. Tonight, you'll have questions. Please email them to us at reservations at writersblockpresents.com and we will try to address them. I urge you to visit our website to direct you to those great books. Chevaliers has signed book plates from Steve and from Martin. I would suggest that they make a great holiday gift, by the way. And while you're thinking along those lines, please consider making a tax deductible contribution to Writer's Block to keep these events going. Thank you so much. And now here's Steve Martin and Martin Amos. Hello. All right. Hello, Martin. Uh, I'm just going to start by um, saying a, a little story. Uh, Martin and I met. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Asked me to unmute, but I was already unmuted. I've been unmuted for years. Um, anyway, um, uh, Martin and I met about 25 years ago in London and uh, had several dinners together. And since then, we have maintained a, a very, very close friendship by not communicating at all. All. In fact, this is the first time we've talked in about 20, 25 years. Now, I don't see Martin. Am I supposed to? Am I gone? I can I see. I don't hear anyone. Oh, there he is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, uh, one of the thing about doing an, an, an interview about something you've written or something you've made that I've always found uh, uh, complicated is you've worked on this thing. You've perfected it. And now you're going to be asked questions expecting to reinterpret it. Do you find uh, interviews about your books delightful, painful, or uh, illuminating? Um, all three, uh, depend. <laughs> um, but, but it's not um, by definition uh, onerous because you yourself have, have not quite, at this stage, have not quite worked out what you were trying to do. Um, it does take a while to surface what your intent. Now, can you just start by explaining a couple of things? So I've I've read the book. I've read uh, some reviews of the book, interpreting interpretation of the book, all wonderful, and it's explained as an autobiographical novel, or is that an equivalency of autofiction, which I uh, you use in the book? Yes, it is. Yeah, I mean I've I've written. A Memoir that covers a lot of this ground, and um, I didn't want to go back to that. You know, uh, I was born in 1949, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I thought it would be—I—I I can't think of any novel that 
pitches itself knowingly as autobiographical. I mean, it's a huge genre now called life writing, uh, mm -hmm. auto, or auto non-fiction. Um, from the gardening column, you know, to the in in way to the astrology page. I mean. Uh, it didn't exist um, before D. H. Lawrence about a century ago. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's new. And why? Uh, let me ask a question. Why did this catch on and become a genre? And and also uh, the, the part two is its advantage to autobiography, either over it or equal to it. Um, well, there's more. There's room for more art. The mm -hmm. trouble with the memoir is that it's given to you. And I talk to other novelists who've, who've written memoirs, um, including our friend Salman Rushdie. And um, we agreed that it came at about twice the rate of fiction. I mean, it took, mm -hmm. you write 40 pages uh, a month rather than 20. Mm -hmm. uh, lucky. And um, I thought, well, this will be, if you're interested in, I'm amazed that anyone is uh, who isn't actually in the profession. But um, I'm very interested in the philosophy of fiction and what it means and how far away from it are you, just as you, you're a philosopher of comedy, um, as well as being a practitioner. There is well, we'll get we'll get to the uh, the the philosophy you, you, in the book, which I it is interspersed with practical guidance on writing, and you also uh, explain your own book in a way. In the in, in, you know in the chapter headings, you can you can see how it's how it's laid out. I mean, the first part, part one, in, interspersed with the essay is called guideline and then you do another uh, you know part of the novel auto novel then guideline again sort of helping the reader also helping a writer uh understand uh but i how did this how did that shape come about where you have there's five parts in the book then then they're interspersed with essays whatever you want to call them sort of practical essays and then there's more romantic and emotional essays or, or storytelling. What made you do that or know how, know how to do that? Um, you just, um, it is mysterious. And Norman Mailer, who talk more balls than any other writer who's ever lived, um, was incredibly shrewd about, uh, uh, about fiction. And his book about the art of fiction is called The Spooky Art. Mm -hmm. Is it and it's a terrific book and I felt he was he'd been staring over my shoulders I worked for the last thirty or forty years um, but it it is this um, malleable form Lawrence again said you can you can do what you like with it and I I wanted to place myself in this uh, intercessionary role between the writer and the, the reader. Um, I think that's an under-examined relationship, the writer and the reader, incredibly important. And yeah, there, there's some great quotes, which I have, which I'm going to find, because they are some great quotes about the writer and the reader. But did you find that the shape of it was in your head before you started, or did it evolve as you were writing? No, it was, a, it was hard work. Uh, yeah. You have to have the shape. Um, it's a it's a great assurance to the reader that that the writer knows what they're up to, um, and that they're in command. Because it's this is what terrifies the the neophyte writer who's just starting out, who's just to go back a while in time, just rolled a sheet of paper into the typewriter and there it is and you can write there's no one stopping you from doing anything um and you, and you realize in that instant um 
how horrific it would be to live in a country where free expression is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, as sorry, sorry, go ahead. Well, as, as a performer, I know it's possible to fake confidence, but as a writer, I don't think it is possible to fake confidence unless you have a different view. Well, um, confidence is something. Yeah, I, <laughs> I've always had it, um, mm -hmm. and I wonder if that's to do with being the son of a writer. But um, and also having a stepmother who's a very distinguished novelist. Um, if that were true, then there would be a lot more children of writers than there are. I mean, a much better bet to have a coal miner as a father than mm -hmm. statistically, it's much more um, conducive to writing. But I think. You know, what came to me very early was the, the conviction and the enthusiasm for um, this would be my life. And I, mm -hmm. that came on me when I was 20, 21. And um, that, if you really mean it, that brings a lot of confidence. It, it seems like you have it backwards in a way, because normally, to have one's father uh, be a great writer or a great whatever is intimidating to a child. And they, and, and classically, it seemed like go somewhere else. Uh, so they're not in competition. How did that manifest itself? Well, um, I've had conversations with Dmitry Nabokov and with um, Adam Bello, for instance. Mm -hmm. My two. Uh, most admired writers, and they they both um, talked about it in such a way that I wanted to tell them after a few minutes, say, you're too old, mate. You've got to do it when you're very young. Uh -huh. um, then you're uh, crazy and stupid and brave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You go ahead. If you leave it even a few years, then you will be... Um, trammeled by self-consciousness and every sentence you write will you'll have 10 objections to it in your head right charge, charge on and, and was was your inclination to write fueled by your father or you or admired him or you just loved writing you loved the words or is it all those things you know all those things and um, I, I, I was 14 or 15 before I discovered what kind of writer my father was and my stepmother was. And um, they could have been writing westerns uh, or translation for all I knew. But I sort of thought they were, they were writing what is summed up in the Anthony Trollope novel the title of his magnum opus, which is The Way We Live Now. Mm -hmm. I would call it, that was their subject. And that's what I wanted to write about. And it seemed to me tremendously worth doing. How do we live now? You know, it's, it, and it renews itself for every generation. Did you find a facility with words and sentences and paragraphs? Uh, was it inherent or? or did you get it from reading? Um, well, reading would be a huge part of it. It was never inerrant. Um, I hope to have that quality attributed to the to the uh, Quran and and to the American <laughs> Constitution of inerrancy. Um, mm -hmm. Cannot even be questioned. Um, but when I look back at my first certainly two novels. Um, it, they're embarrassingly crude, I find. Um, you mean your first published novels? No, well, that's the same thing. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, but I didn't know if you had some you put in a drawer. Uh, no, I didn't yeah. have to draw my books. Um, I just did it. And that, that was the, the great luck, was having, having the uh, absurd arrogance to do that. 
Right. I have a question just before we, uh, this, this uh, little term you use uh, in the book, essentially during the, I'd say fictional part, you called, called you're talking about a writer and you called it a, a, a smirk novel. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about a smirk novel? Because I'm sure I write them. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's only one I, I mean, Nabokov parodies a smirk novel in Lolita the lot. And mm -hmm. it, the marvelously, serenely self-absorbed uh, narrator who uh -huh. refers, refers to things like, um, uh, I, perhaps I have insufficiently stressed the effect on all women of my striking, perhaps somewhat brutal good looks. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I think that every day, I must be a smirk person. Uh, I want to ask you, you talk in the book about having started a mm, autobiographical book called Life. I think I have that correct. And you abandoned it. And I'm curious why, what transformation it made or did it, or did you start afresh to come to this? What, what made you abandon life and change into this book? Yeah, it was called Life, colon, a novel. It's very pretentious, mm -hmm. um, but this was 20 years ago when I had my first go at it. And um, among the things that were inhibiting me was the fact that they were all, well, Saul Bellow and Christopher Hitchens were, as they say, very much alive at that point. Mm -hmm. And one of the hazards of being a, a life writer, which I don't think of myself as being, is that you, you're worried about being sued. Um, Lawrence himself uh, was harassed by the police for obscenity, famously, um, and seminally, because thereafter it became possible to write about the things he was prosecuted for, but also for libel. And Saul Fellow himself um, used to have sleepless weeks before the publication of a novel in case that happened. And he would get friends who appeared in the novel to sign waivers promising they would never uh, litigate. Um, very uh, worldly consideration when publishing a novel, rather uncomfortably worldly in my view. So that's part of the transformation is to cloak uh, named figures in this iteration of it, or? Well, no, I, if, if I were writing conventionally in this mode, I would call Saul Bellow, you know, Solomon mm -hmm. Mello or something. Oh Isn't yeah. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. uh, the well-known people in the book are given their full names. Right. But I, want, I wanted well, to... Go ahead. I just wanted to... Um, and I, from what fellow writers have said, I was... I didn't think about it much at the time, but um, it does... The narrator and the author are sort of hovering around the book in a way that I haven't, at a distance that I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. And you are actually a figure, a named figure, so you could possibly sue yourself. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I, I do. Uh, now, in, in the book, you have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, three major authorial relationships, not counting your father. You have Philip Larkin, you have Saul Bellow, and Christopher Hitchens. Now, do you, th is, is that accurate to say? Yeah. yeah. Do you feel you were born into them at exactly the right time? Um, could it have been replaced if you were born 10 years later by three different people? Men, no. it's hypothetical, but. No, that, because they're, they're, they're of their time, but they're also of my time and I, you know, Philip Larkin was the one I read first. And he was a figure from my childhood. 
and occasionally my youth and adulthood. Um, and then Christopher was a, Hitchens was a lifelong friend and we grew up in parallel, it, as often happens, you know, had got married at the same time, had children at the same time, got divorced at the same time, got remarried at the same time, had a, additional children at the same time. So one of those tandem friends um, with whom you discuss all these life changes. Um, so I, I, I don't think that, that uh, configuration could be repeated. It was just lucky. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about Christopher Hitchens? Because he is woven through this book uh, seriously. And, you know, you, each of these authors you talk about, Larkin, Bellow, and Hitchens, all represent loss in the book. And to describe the loss very well and uh, warmly, but not uh, in a corny way. It's, it's very moving, but you're at a distance from it with the exception probably of Christopher Hitchens. I'm fascinated by him. And it, was he the kind of person you talked with every day or you just had an ongoing rapport? Um, it, it did get to be every day. Um, mm -hmm. as, not just when he fell ill. Mm -hmm. at, um, in 2010, but um, you would no, you would report in every day. And mm -hmm. he was a, a, a strident figure with his. Uh, it's not atheism; it's anti-theism. I think I read that in your book. Was he? Did he suffer from abuse by people? Did it affect him? Great And um, after one skirmish that was uh, all over the newspapers for a few days. I, I, I called him and I, and I was on tour and I called him and I said, you know, how, how are you? And he said, oh man, I'm living in a world of pain. He said, because wow. what done was so unpopular. And um, people think that, that he took up these contrarian positions. Um, to stir things up and um, or that he enjoyed controversy. But um, he, was, he was as dependent as we all are on the approval of his peers. Right. And, um, he did suffer and he suffered ho horribly from uh, the invasion of Iraq, which he'd championed and gone on the road for. Mm -hmm. Way that I never understood, but he was um, Christopher was wrong regularly. He did <laughs> right from the start when he was a Trotskyist, and he went on being a Trotskyist until his last words. Um, mm -hmm. And you, don't go to, you never went to Christopher for common sense. There are dozens of extremely talented and intelligent journalists and controversialists who, who have common sense to burn, you know, but you, that was not what you went to Christopher for. You went to him for intellectual drama. Um, and it, 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 that was just how he was. That was just his temperament. And temperament, as I'm sure you know, is, is, is directly linked to facility and talent in that, um, and, and to your whole direction as a writer. Um, you know, are you tolerant? Are you whimsical? Are you orderly? You know, these things all appear in one's book. Well, by the way, his, his story is woven so beautifully through the book from beginning to end. And uh, I, I love the quote he said uh, about chemotherapy Oh, I have it here. I'll, I'll find it in a minute. Oh, yes. Uh, in a room with ke ke chemotherapy, whereby you sit in a room with a set of other finalists. <laughs> he quoted that. But I want to talk about specifically about the book for a second. And I'll start with this. Uh, I'm going to have to name drop here. I was talking to Salman Rushdie, 
one time, many years ago, probably 20 years ago, we were talking about book interviews. And he said, you know, when I do an interview about my book, I think, gee, it would be so much better if you just open the book, put your finger down on a sentence that said, tell us about that sentence. I said, already it would be a better interview. <clears throat> and so I, I didn't really do that, but I, <clears throat> I found some beautiful sentences in the book that maybe you want to talk about and maybe you don't. This is, uh, one is a, a beautiful sentence about childhood and you're, you're uh, in your apartment room somewhere and you hear the sound of children's laughter outside the window, as I recall. And you said, the sentence is, what was that? What was solitary child song? Something like a ventilation of happiness. Eliza for now was not letting off steam, but letting off happiness. She was singing in the garden. Um, and uh, it, it just haunted me that, uh, that, this, that the childish state fills you with, uh, with that kind of ex exaltation. And it's so apt. I mean, I have a seven-year-old myself, and I thought, oh, I've heard that sound before. Yeah. Um, and it's something that, that uh, goes on occurring to you throughout your life, that, that um, things that, that thrilled you as a child become inimical as you get older. Mm -hmm. Two examples, birthdays. Mm -hmm. you know, many happy returns, we say, but many diminishing returns is what we mean. <laughs> it's, it's longer fun, as I'm sure you've already experienced. And the other thing is snow. Um, I used to go to sleep lusting for snow you know, dreaming about snow and was so thrilled when it fell. But now when I walk the blinds and see snow, I look, <laughs> you know, with settled hatred at an enemy that I thought, who I thought had forgotten me. But he, All the things you have to put on, the clothes and the boots. And anyway, that's great. Now, I have another sentence here, which takes us into another direction. This is sort of during the, uh, this is during the novelistic part and uh, you're describing a woman as she walks toward you. He says, all right, she was lightly blonde. The auburn hair had been recently and professionally primped. It now lay in moist coils and runnels. And there was the business suit and the business shirt and the business shoes. But the face itself was not businesslike, not cunning, not even particularly shrewd just sensible and amused. She took four or five steps in his direction and her walk with its looseness and ease told him something about, something new about her body. She liked it, which was a very good start. Now this gets into a, a description of sex and appeal and uh, men viewing women in a certain way and I don't know, you, you talk about later where the rules had slightly changed about other, other things. And, but this feels right on the money, uh, accurate, you know? Um, yeah, I, but I, I was about to launch in at that stage in the book into, into saying why writers can't write about sex. Um, well, you do talk, you, you say that three things a novel, a novel really can't do well is, uh, religion, dreams, and sex. And I was gonna argue, I said, well, this is kind of sex. I know what you mean. You mean descriptive sex is difficult in a novel. I'd love for you to talk about those three areas. Well, Nabokov said of sex, he said, um, Nabokov said, as general advice, not talking about sex. And in fact, there are no swear words or, or even bodily words in Nabokov. But he said, as advice to young readers, young writers, caress the detail. But don't do that when you're writing about sex. <laughs> yeah. uh, then, then you, you're owning up to your own uh, quirks and uh, your own uh, 
susceptibility to the perverse. And um, the thing that dreams, um, religion and sex, what they have in common is uh, a lack of universality. And although you want to stress uh, individualism in the novel, of course you do. You want to stress character and, um, and all the rest. But you have to try and keep the universal in view. And um, with dreams, for instance, we've all had the one where you, because you're taking a public exam and for some reason you're in the nude and um, and your pen has just run out of ink, etc. Hey, um, you're turning me on. <laughs> <laughs> but we've all had that one and the flying one and mm -hmm. the monster one. But otherwise, once a dream gets going, I, I seem to be walking down this, then it changed into a, um, you know, summary. <laughs> the, the, the universal. And same with religion. Um, there was a great quote uh, from uh, Henry James, who said, uh, he said, uh, quote a dream, lose a reader, cite a dream. In a dream is a reader. Yeah, um, right. And yeah, I think um, that's what's wrong with Kafka is that it's all it's all a dream, and it it works beautifully in the short stories. Um, as Doctor Johnson said, nothing odd will do long. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. ten-page story, Borges. Um, uh, can be as strange as it likes, but when it's 400 pages, then it, beca it becomes like nonsense verse and, and you, your appetite is limited. You have a, a description of uh, loss. I've talked about that before with Christopher Hitchens, but also you talk about, I don't know if it was your mother and your father or a mother or a father, but I love these quotes. The death of a father kicks the son upstairs. And then about your about the mother, you say the loss of a mother, with the death of the mother, the son goes skyward too, clutching the banister and more or less of his own volition, but he is seeking his childhood room and his childhood bed. Two very different responses to mother and father. They're very different kind of people. Um, um, yeah, and that was what happened to me. And a lot of writing is assuming what happens to you is universal, that you uh, everyone's feelings. Um, but I, I felt a sort of stiffening of the backbone when my father died, and I felt a deliquescence when my mother died. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't cope with it. Um, 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 one th going back to Christopher Hitchens for a second, I love this, uh, you described it as a person who kept two sets of books. Uh, one is romantic incendiary and the other is the Beaumont. Can you ex explicate that a bit? Yeah, I mean, he, he, was, um, he was a socialist and also a, a socialite. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, the first time he was on American TV, there was a, 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 a terrible little um, chancer who was interviewing him, who said with a sneer, as if he was saying the word leper, he said, are you, are you a liberal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mid Reagan. And um, Christopher said, no, I'm a socialist. And uh, everyone was aghast, you could tell on the, but, um, but that's, he never modified that position. Mm -hmm. um, despite being very well informed about all, all the disasters and famines and terrors of being, uh, of the socialist system. You know, um, I'd like to talk about writing a bit uh, there's kind of three areas I got from your book. One is the concept of anti-elitism, 
One is the use of the uh, subconscious. And uh, the, your quote is a frictionless verbal surface. Because there are passages in the book that are really just straight, pure, great advice for writers. How, how does, uh, first, let's talk about the subconscious. Well, you, you talk about that in your book and- um, Yes, it, I do. I believe in it deeply, yeah. It's a very mysterious force. And it's what um, Mailer was talking about in the spooky arc. Uh, it, it is cleverer than you. And mm -hmm. gives you ideas and puts things in your book that you that you later cut, but sometimes you you reach for it as if for a life bill, um, and your subconscious subconscious has anticipated that need that you will need this minor character to perform some menial task, um, and it's a year or two ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to catch up with it. Um, Mine is eight hours, but a year or two is a good one. Good, good for you. <laughs> sometimes it's a year or two. You sometimes yeah. have to sleep on sleep on it, and sleep on it more than once. Um, but you you learn to humor your own subconscious. I mean, this is probably what you're talking about. That when you when you arrive at a, at a roadblock when you're writing. I now sweep away from my desk and I go and do something else, um, usually read. But um, then my legs will take me back to my desk and I realize that the problem has been fixed, not through work of mind, mm -hmm. it's, it's all the back of the mind, or, mm -hmm. uh, it goes down the spine. Um, and it's, it, it means that a force that, that really does feel supernatural is there to thwart you or to help you, depending. And, and it feels incredibly real. It doesn't feel like a, something you're imagining. No, it, it seems... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I find sometimes if I hit a roadblock is to clearly pose the question to myself what the problem is. And then 24 hours later, sometimes the solution just feels, oh, you know, while you're making a sandwich. Yeah. Not that I've ever made a sandwich. But, but I want to talk about this, a very important, a topic for, oh, sorry if I interrupted you. No, go ahead. A, a, an important topic, this anti-elitism that is very current and popular in America today. And you discuss it in terms of uh, writing, if you want a reminder, I can read. Uh, the, this is so beautifully written, I'll read it. You say, are there anti-elitists when they go to the doctor or when they board a plane or when they hire a lawyer or an electrician or indeed a hairdresser? Show me a sphere where we exalt the ordinary, the inexpert, the amateurish, the average. I know, when, well, and this is, this is now called populism. Um, and we have a, a very average, or <laughs> could hardly call him that, a president uh, fighting the bouncers as he's, you know, led from the, from the hall. Um, and whenever I heard the phrase President Trump for the last four years, um, I was always like, you're kidding, you know, I mean, um, but they, what they loved about him was that he talks like them. I went to a, a Trump um, rally and uh, they exult in, in the lack of distance between them and their thought processes and those of Trump. Um, they like him being a, a lout and a brute because um, they can you know, feel uh, oh, they're often, you know, superior to Trump in all ways, but they they just love that amateurishness, and it doesn't apply to any other area of life. 
but it seems like we're in a, it's taking a deadly form of the denial of uh, science and doctors. Exactly. And, um, and, and I mean, there was a, just to be, let me digress just for a minute. Please. Because we revolt against logic and reason at the, in the early uh, 20th century that went right through to the mid 20th century. And uh, Stalin and Hitler and others never used the word reason without giving it an adjective like cowardly, mm -hmm. you know, um, pusillanimous, you know, um, and, th and they burst free from, from reason. And it's tremendously empowering for a while because um, anything seems possible. And, and Trump, um, as we saw with Trump, it, it, it works for a while. And then uh, the ground turns to marshland beneath your feet and uh, nothing means anything and, the, and truth loses its value. And this was dramatized in the, in the case of Hitler. Who, who, he fooled Chamberlain at Munich by just lying. And, and Chamberlain came back and said, a week or two, he said, I, I just couldn't absorb the fact that I was being lied to by a head of state. Um, it has the power to astonish and, um, it, it, and it is effective, but only for a short time. And this is- Might this be something you write about in the future? Well, um, the reason that, that reason lost its force were, was because of um, what Hitler called the Jewish science, sciences of, of uh, cosmology, Einstein, um, the subconscious, specifically in the case of Freud, and sociology, Max Weber and others. Um, which seemed to suggest that life wasn't this logical, empirical procedure that we'd all assumed it was, um, that life was weird and therefore truth was malleable. Um, and, and Trump is he's just following his temperament, but, um, but he has reduced Americans to to, to a sort of shakiness about truth and verifiability and all those other staples of reasonable thought. This is this will be kind of a blending of topics because I'm still still fascinated by the mechanics uh, of writing. And you have a passage. You talk about three inappropriate uses of words uh, from other other literature. Uh, do you want to talk about those? Do you want me to remind you of them or do you recall them? I think I do, yeah. yeah. And it also brings up the question of decorum. I bought three history books and I was uh, looking at, looking through them. And the first instance was um, a book about Hitler saying that Hitler felt, quote, unquote, upbeat after his vacation <laughs> in the Alps. Uh, the second quote was that uh, that satire was a very strange, must have been a very strange genre when it appeared. And, um, you know, early, uh, early readers of The Modest Proposal must have, Swift, must have been gobsmacked. Right? And, uh, and the third one was, uh, it was actually Kaiser Wilhelm I, um, is commended by one historian for having the smarts to use Bismarck to do all his foreign policy. Um, and this is not and, and it's, as a writer reader, you're reading that, and it is it sort of amusing, uh, in, amusingly inappropriate, or does your inner uh, schoolmarm come out and want to slap him on the wrist? <laughs> My inner everything comes out, <laughs> um, not just anachronistic, but it also offends decorum, which um, has, whose decorum's literary meaning is something like the opposite of its um, conversational meaning. 
it has to do decorum in conversation has to do with politesse um, and good manners and all that but um in literature it just means suiting the words to the meaning the tone of the words to the meaning and when i when i think about people being gobsmacked in you know 17 <laughs> Um, just imagine the conversation, you know, how did you, how did Lady Letitia, how did you find the reading from Jonathan, Jonathan Swift's um, modest proposal? Well, frankly, sir, I was gobsmacked. I mean, the whole thing collapses in yeah. the most ugly way possible. I guess it's the idea of being taken out of the book you're reading by reading an inappropriate word or a, ro a word that's... Uh, uh, anachronistic in a way. Anachronistic. Yeah. And you know, you know something's gone very wrong indeed when you start imagining the the writer, the historian in these cases. Um, and you start to imagine him at his desk, and you and you begin to wonder what kind of mind. Um, who does this writer think he's pleasing? when he says upbeat and um, gobsmacked and smart. Um, I suppose there must be one reader in a hundred or a thousand who will give a complicit leer when he sees some you know, recent colloquialism in print, but um, virtually all the rest will veer back in disgust. You have some comments. I, I, there's one thing I want to discuss. We're getting a little short on time, but um, <clears throat> about cultural appropriation. You have a very brief paragraph about it in the book. I could read it, or you could talk about how you feel about it. Um, well, I, um, I, it's much on my mind because I'm writing about race in America at the moment, short stories. And um, I'm definitely appropriating something because I've never lived mm -hmm. through it. On the other hand, I've written two novels about the Holocaust and I'm uh, appropriating that. But uh, cultural appropriation is what the novel is. Um, you're taking an experience that isn't yours and you're trying to inhabit it and imagine it. That's what the novel is. Um, so with some uh, commissar telling you what you can and can't do, because the, the greater principle is that, that fiction is freedom. Of course it is. Um, it wouldn't be there if it wasn't, you know. This is, this is you, and you never give an inch of freedom away. And I will, I will, would apologize for if I upset people, but um, I'm not going to stop doing that. That would just that, that cancels the whole of Anglophone literature if you um, if if you prohibit that. Um, I found it telling. Uh, I'm just watching the time loop. I think we're fine. Uh, I know we want to take some questions uh, at the end of the book. Uh, you, you've opened the book, but you kind of talked that this is going to be your last book. You have said that somewhere in, in so many words. And then the very last paragraph in the book, it says, goodbye, my reader, I said, goodbye, my dear, my close, my gentle. Now that is a real goodbye. And then you have an afterthought an addendum, a postscript, and a post postscript. <laughs> yeah. haven't, haven't quite stopped. And now you tell me you're writing uh, two other books on the Holocaust and something else. Well, I've already written the two books on the Holocaust. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm contemplating a third if I live long enough. Um, I, no, I, what I said was that I won't write another long novel. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it, it's just. It, even if your um, if your powers are still there, it's a very exhausting thing to write a long novel. You have to keep it all in your mind. 
Right. When you begin a novel, you you enter this very wide entrance, um, and by the time you you're done, you 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 come out as if from a manhole um, with an audible pop, because you 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 constrained yourself with all these patterns and themes and so on, and um, it it just gets uh, really torturous, and so. Chekhov said in late in life that everything he read seemed to him not short enough. And <laughs> that does come over you as you age. Yeah. What's a, a Bellows quote about Augie March? Oh, when uh, we were talking about how um, it's 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 sort of silly to say what's this novel about, and someone asked so said. I mean, what's the adventures of Augie March about? And he said, it's about 200 pages too long. <laughs> it's a good joke to end with. But I, I want to jump, jump back for one thing, because we were, we're talking about your uh, birthdays. And strangely, there's a cartoon in my book that is a, a, a hospital room of the baby just having been born. And the doctors are there and the mother and father are there and the nurse is holding up the baby to the doctors and the baby says, this is my best birthday ever. <laughs> now, should I ask uh, Andrea, we were gonna ask some questions. I'm worried about time. I always, uh, uh, being a performer, I like shorter rather than longer. Although this is incredibly fascinating. Andrea, are you there to step in? Andrea, Andrea is here to step in. I have lots of questions that we've received, so many. Um, <laughs> Just a two minute break just to go to the bathroom. You can have a two minute break. Well, maybe quicker than two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Intermission. Um, you know, there's a, uh, just, you know, there's a thing I grew up with, um, you know, I grew up in the 50s and there was a thing that was legitimately sold called a traveler's friend. And what it was, was for drivers and it was a tin can, fancy tin can that wrapped around your leg with a tube that went up inside your pants. So drivers did not have to pull over to use the restroom. Clearly that was not around in Martin's milieu. No, but he, he doesn't know about it, but we won't tell him either. <laughs> Should I? By the way, how fascinating was that? It was so fun. Oh, it's so fun. But I have why not, while Martin is otherwise yep. engaged, why don't I ask a question that's come in for you? Well, okay, we have lots of questions for you too. Great, um, great. Steve, have you ever entered the New Yorker caption contest under under an assumed name? And have you ever won? You know what? I haven't, and I'll tell you why. First, I think the the results are already so good. I, I don't feel competitive, but also because I've written for the New Yorker, I, you know, I have this sort of waspy guilt that I would be breaking, I would be breaking a rule. You can't enter if you've written, if you work there, if you do this, if you do that. So I have this uh, kind of a pre manufactured guilt about trying to enter it. I do try to come up with them occasionally. And I always thought they were fabulous. You know, one of my favorite books is, uh, uh, the New Yorker published it maybe, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago, but it was book cartoon, a book of cartoons that were in the New Yorker that no one got. And they had the writer explain it. <laughs> and it was a nice, you know, uh, 200 page book filled with cartoons that people <laughs> said, huh? Which is very much, I'm finding it's a very big part of the cartooning is the huh. It's, it's almost essential because nobody's huh is the same to in, in the same response to a certain cartoon. They might love it and then somebody else will go, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, wait, and I have, um, okay, on that same subject. Is you know Martin what? back? I thought I heard him. Martin is back. You know what, I'm gonna go to, we'll go to Martin and yeah. then I'll try to find that other thing. Martin, um, in response to your comments about populism and anti-elitism, are you? Oh, <laughs> uh, I was adjusting. Okay, Boris Johnson was a classic student at Oxford, yet he acts like a buffoon. 
um, anti-elitists embrace him. Can you explain not only the appeal, but his self-abasement? Um, that's perhaps too much. I don't, I, I'll quote um, Clive James, the late great Clive James, who said, um, it, it, these are all basically differences in taste. Um, and this goes uh, especially for Trump. It, called the Barry Manilow law. And he said, everyone, everyone you know thinks Barry Manilow is absolutely terrible, but everyone you don't know thinks he's great. <laughs> um, and I think that puts it all in proportion because uh, people you don't know are uh, astronomically outnumbered by the people you do. Um, and this is just a taste you're never going to understand. Um, and I, I've certainly been feeling nothing else but that for the last four years or more. Um, and did... so Boris, Boris Johnson's appeal, um, he's, he, he's just a um, pompous windbag. Um, uh, he, he's educated, but he's still uh, basically stupid. Um, Martin, did Saul Bellow give you the same kind of intellectual drama that C Christopher Hitchens did? Um, well, more imaginative, imaginative drama in that I would read him and feel elevated and stimulated um, in a way that Christopher often, uh, he often had that effect on me. But, um, but Saul was seldom addressing himself to, sort of, to questions of uh, common sense and logic. Um, he was in a different realm. Um, Steve, when you write uh, cartoon captions, is it like uh, writing jokes for stand-up? Or how does it differ? It's completely different. Uh, first of all, you know, jokes for stand-up are integrated into something. Uh, they're a part of a larger piece. Uh, an another great distinction is also you're talking to someone, you're talking to an audience, or I'm talking to Marty Short. Um, and a, a joke on stage, for example, is something you can refine. You do it one night and then you refine it the next night, you refine it. But a cartoon is done. It's almost done at the very moment it's conceived. And you don't really have a, even a way to try it out. You, sh you know, I mean, in the book, we have illustrations of me showing it to my wife, showing it to my daughter, and finally showing it to my cat. Yeah. You know, but there's, there's really no, uh, and you're talking about a singularity, this little single thing. And our, you know the book has 150 cartoons in it, so it, it takes on a different life. Uh, it's a very different thing. It's a it's completely it's not instantaneous. Although sometimes the cartoon occurs instantaneously, but after two hours of thought. Different form. Yeah, it's very different. It's really fun to not have to depend on a response immediately. You know. <laughs> Yeah, but well, we should we could we could have a, a long discussion about comedy and what's it for and what is it and what is laughter. Uh, we, I don't, I wish I'd seen um, some explanatory essay about this because I, I can't I can't explain it. I, I can't explain it. It's a release of tension having to do with irony or. Um, something hidden from you that is suddenly revealed and, and it, it usually is deflationary. Um, this is good. Uh, Nietzsche said uh, a joke is an epigram on the death of a feeling. Now that, 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 that is a brilliant description of a sick joke. Um, but a, a, a normal joke is uh, is exposing stupidity, um, and 
that that is it's cooler in a way and um, so what say it again i didn't hear that last word cooler uh -huh. it, it's more elitist than a sick joke um i i have never been able to put my finger on it because i know jokes work 50 different ways you know some are just because they're kind because they're nice sometimes they're tough you know i mean i can make I, I can, in my show, I can make fun of Marty Short and he can make fun of me. And it's so benign. And it's almost as though you're saying, wouldn't it be funny if I said this to Marty Short? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You do that, you do that in this book with Harry Bliss. You and Harry have, you know, back and forth about what's funny and what's not. In, right. In, a, in the cartoons, and it, it's, hilarious well i talked to carl reiner once he was about to go on stage for the director's guild and he, he had hosted it every year for 20 years and he's right he's about to go on stage and i said what are you going to do what are you going to open with he said i don't know i said as a professional comedian i said what are you talking about you don't know he said i don't i don't know what i'm going to say i just go out and say what they're thinking say what they're thinking see what they're thinking what the audience is thinking well, How it is this, this, this um, pas de deux. It's a, it's a, a same in 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 writing that um, you're anticipating a response, um, and which refines your response. And um, it is, um, what is the word? I mean, it is synergy. You know, it's a mm -hmm. combination of things. We have time for a few more. Um, Martin. Ask Martin because he's the uh, he's okay. the big figure here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Martin, this book is a lot more gentle than your others. Why the difference in tone for Inside Story? <clears throat> um, well, why is never really the anything that occurs to you. Why am I doing this? Um, it's like you don't develop you just look at the implications of what you've done already and follow that um it i guess it's it's to do with uh, me getting older and more forgiving and uh not feeling that i have to judge and uh and pour scorn on any, anything but I'm, I, I'm sure Steve found this because his book has the same quality. You also discover whether you have grudges, whether you have things that rankle in you, whether you're sour. Um, and that just emerges naturally from your, from your nature. Hmm. Um... It's not a decision. It's a sort of evolutionary change. What drew you to Saul Bellow over Philip Roth, for example? Why did Bellow speak more to you than Philip Roth? Well, Philip Roth spoke to me piercingly in one novel, Port Noise Complain, which is uh, by many magnitudes his best novel in my view. Um, but otherwise, I, I think it's, he's rather an effortful writer. You can see him straining for effect. Um, and, and there's a sort of, I, I don't know, I, with Saul Bellow, I just felt that his words weigh more. They, they weigh in a higher density than anyone else is, very much including Philip Roth. Um, Steve, I do have one for you, if you'll indulge us. Um, sure. And I love, I love this question. So there you go. Um, Salman Rushdie told, you know, said he wished that people would just open a page and point. So uh, somebody wrote in about um, the myth of Sisyphus back. Yes. Okay, <laughs> this is one of the funniest cartoons in the book, although I have 
many favorites. So can you talk about the myth of Sisyphus? And, yeah. You know. uh, as we know, just the myth of Sisyphus is here she's pushing up a rock and, and it keeps rolling back and it keeps pushing up the hill and can't get to the top. Uh, sort of a metaphor of life, I guess. But you know, my, my wife, uh, whom I've been, we've been together with for you know, 17, 18 years, uh, we met because she was a fact checker at the New Yorker and she would fact check my comedy pieces, which sounds strange, but she also used to fact check poetry. And you know, she had to fact check Paul Muldoon's poetry, which can be very oblique, you know, with very esoteric references. And she'd say, did you know that in so-and-so Wales, the stell is actually labeled 1802, you know, something like that. I'm making that up. Uh, but she was fact checking my comedy pieces and I kind of fell in love with fact checking. I didn't know much about it. I thought, uh, you know, facts a fact. And when I was writing my own memoir, I, I so deeply enjoyed the fact checking element, which was involved calling other people for their memories and also going through my stack of memorabilia. I just used to take things, receipts, and throw them in, in cardboard boxes and I could go through and they would be chronological because they were just stacked over time. So I could find a hotel receipt you know, from 1972 and I could, I remember my girlfriend Mitzi was with me and she had photos of, et cetera, et cetera, searching all that out. So anyway, myth of Sisyphus, I just was thinking of fact checking and I thought of the myth of Sisyphus and I thought, well, okay, the rock is really paper mache. The grade is 10%, not 40%. He, his real name is Manny. It works uh, 40 hours a week with the weekends off. He has a stand in, you know, I, I just, it, it was just a play on, fact checking, I guess. And, and Harry drew it so beautifully. You, you can feel the sinewy muscles on the guy pushing the uh, boulder up the rock. Uh, it's one of my favorite cartoons in there too. Well, it's a, it's a tragic myth, that of Sisyphus. Right. Um, and it, um, we all feel like Sisyphus. <laughs> it's not fact checking. I, I'm all for fact checking. and. Um, nothing's always welcome, but no suggestions about style, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I, if I may quote Clive James again, he'd had a bruising session with not just the fact checker at the New Yorker, but uh, the stylistic um, uh, counselor. And he said, I, he said, it flashed into my mind but, uh, and I rejected it because it was cruel. But what I wanted to say was, listen, if I wrote like that, I'd be you. <laughs> well, I, there is a difference between fact checking and editing. And editing yeah. can, is, is also, I, I love editing, but it, that's where you find those sentences like, gee, what, what a what great way to take the fun out of a sentence. Yeah. Uh, no, that, that you, you, Everything in you resists that, but fact checking, no, you may not use to go with the fact checker, but um, it's nice to know if you're factually wrong. See, and because your book is a novel, Martin, you don't need fact checkers, right? That's right. You don't there you go. You got out of that easily. <laughs> I, um, I want to thank both of you so very much. This is so fun, and I hope that we can bring you back soon to writer's block because it's so great and i thank you so much i really enjoyed myself great to see you again martin great to see you and um we have one of these every other night yes I, uh, yeah all right <laughs> thank you everybody oh and go to um go to our website so that you can get links to these great books and remember the holidays are coming so <laughs> what could be better? Anyway, thank you, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.